Okay, so today we're going to have uh, kind of a weird lesson. It's going to continue off what we did yesterday, and then we're going to cover something really, really quick and really new uh, called polarization today. So let's get going. So we're going to finish off those double slit examples from uh, last class. That was on page seven of that new part two booklet. And then we're going to introduce a really quick new concept called polarization, which connects directly to the wave nature of light. I'll show you why in a little, a little later on today. Uh, and then I'll give you guys some practice time. Hopefully it'll be quite a bit. So this is on page seven of uh, the, the work booklet, of course. Uh, it's question number four on that page. A diffraction grating has 1,000 lines per centimeter. Uh, when light passes through the grating, an interference pattern is produced on a screen four meters away. The first order anti-node is 19.2 centimeters from the central maximum. What is the color of the light? That's a really weird question. Uh, in the note booklet, right on the back of the first page, I actually have a little chart that I've thrown in showing uh, the wavelengths of different colors of light. That's how you're gonna have to figure this out. In other words, when it's asking for a color of a light, you have to find the wavelength and then connect that back uh, to the color, right? So anyway, might as well start with that. We're looking for a wavelength. That's our unknown. We know the diffraction grating has a thousand lines per centimeter, okay? What I wanna remind you is that D represents the, diff the distance between two different slits. Well, if there's a thousand lines per centimeter, you're taking your centimeter and you're chopping it into a thousand pieces. So if we go one centimeter divided by a thousand, you're gonna get one thousandth of a centimeter, or in other words, I'll just turn it into meters for you, uh, 1.0 times 10 to the negative five meters. That's the distance between two different slits. So we'll say D is 1.0 times 10 to the negative five meters. Uh, the other thing we know in this question is the interference patterns produced on a screen that's four meters away. The distance to the next screen, of course, is your L. That's 4.00 meters. Uh, the first order anti-node, that's the first other bright spot other than the central one. That means N is one because it's the first order, is 19.2 centimeters from the central maximum. So that's the distance of that bright spot from the central bright spot. That's your X. So X is 0 0.192 meters. Got to turn it into meters, right? Uh, looks like we have pretty much everything we need. Uh, we're looking for our wavelength, of course, because that'll help us with uh, figuring out the color of the light. Um, but the information we have right now is kind of setting up a small angle approximation. If you don't use the small angle approximation, we have to use that other one that has theta in it already. So no matter how you slice this, we have to find what that angle is. And to find the angle, it's probably easiest to draw a picture first. We're going to let that, uh, that line right there be my screen. This is going to be the diffraction grating, I'm just going to draw two of the slits just to make it a little easier on myself. Uh, we know we have our central maximum, it's right between the two slits, so it would be about right there. Uh, the first order anti-node is 19.2 centimeters away from it. Let's just put it over here just for good measure, uh, and then we'll write that, that's 0 0.192 meters. We know the distance to the screen is 4 meters, 4.00 meters, uh, and we're looking for this angle to determine whether or not we're allowed to use the small angle approximation. Well, to find this angle, just like the one we did last class, uh, we're gonna have to use tan, because tan is opposite over adjacent. So this is gonna equal 0 0.192 over 4.00. Take the inverse tan of that, you're gonna find theta equals, uh, I'll just do it to the nearest hundredth, uh, 2.74 degrees. That's a two right there, 2.74 degrees. Remember the rule of thumb is if the angle is less than 10 degrees, you can use the small angle approximation. This is clearly less than 10 degrees, so it will work. Uh, the small angle approximation says that uh, lambda, your wavelength, equals XD over NL. Let's just throw those numbers in there then. Uh, X is 0 0.192, D is 1.0 times 10 to the negative five. N in this case is just one, and L is 4.00. Throw those numbers in there, get it in your calculator. You're gonna find that that's uh, four. Oh, this is weird. Yeah, it's 479 times 10 to the negative nine if you're gonna do it this way. Uh, the reason we're doing it this way is of course nanometers is uh, times 10 to the negative nine. So right there we can see that this is 479 nanometers. Uh, so 479 nanometers, if we took a look in our chart, that's gonna fall in this box right up here. Uh, it's going to fall within that range, right? So in other words, this light, based on its wavelength, we can tell that this is blue light. And that would be my final answer, because the question was asking, what is the color 
of the light. And asking for the color of the light is just basically another way of asking for what's the wavelength of the light. You will not have to memorize this chart, don't you worry. Uh, this is kind of a rare kind of question. I think there's a few others like that in the sample questions, but it's good to know the reference chart is in uh, the notebooklet. Moving on. Question number five, the 630 nanometer laser, so that's the wavelength of the laser light, uh, which going back here, what was it, 630? It tells you it's gonna be a red laser, clearly. Uh, not that that's important here. 630 nanometer lasers are shines through a diffraction reading that has 500 lines per centimeter. What is the angle between the central maximum and the first antinode? Uh, this one is kind of like a very reduced version of the other question, but let's, let's just get started on this, I guess. We might as well say the wavelength is uh, 630 nanometers, so 630 times 10 to the negative nine meters. The diffraction grading is 500 lines per centimeter, so we can do the same thing we did before, one divided by 500. This is going to give us 2.00 times 10 to the negative five meters. If I turn that into meters first, which I did, sorry, I just didn't show it there. Uh, and that's gonna be your D value, so D equals 2.00 times 10 to the negative uh, 10 to the negative five sorry meters oh what else do we know on this one we're looking for the angle so theta is our unknown we know it's the first antinode maybe that'll be useful so n is one uh well we only have two formulas for this um unfortunately a diagram is not going to help us because we don't know how far away the screen is but our two formulas are lambda or wavelength in other words is equal to d sine theta over n or we have the small angle approximation lambda equals xd over nl. Hopefully you can see the small angle approximation here. We can't use it because we don't know x and we don't know l, so this is no good. We have to use this one, and the good news is we know our wavelength, we know d, we know n, we're just looking for theta. So let's throw those numbers in there. Um, just to make my life a little easier, I'm gonna isolate sine theta first, so I'll times by n and then divide by d. So sine theta is equal to lambda n divided by d, uh, then I can throw my numbers in there directly. So sine theta equals 630 times 10 to the negative 9. That was your lambda uh, times by n, which is 1, divided by d, which is 2.00 times 10 to the negative 5. Whew, if you throw that in your calculator and then take the inverse sine of it, I'm not going to show all the work to save time. You're going to get theta equals 1. Point, how many sig digs? Two sig digs, 1.81 degrees. So that would be our angle. There you go, there wasn't too much to that. It's just a matter of listing out your variables uh, and making sure you can plug in the rest. Last one here, a diffraction grading producing an interference pattern is moved further away from a screen. How do the following variables change? Um, well, here's what's kind of interesting. This is going to rely on our understanding of the two formulas, right? So the two formulas again are lambda equals D sine theta over N and lambda equals XD over NL. Uh, the one thing that's telling us is the diffraction grating is being moved further away. That's just a fancy way of saying that your L, which is the distance from the diffraction grating to the screen, L is increasing. So we can immediately go through this list and find L and say, all right, L, that's going to be increasing. Let's now kind of just go through the rest of the list here, right? Just to talk about each component. Wavelength. The wavelength is the wavelength of the light, of course. So in other words, it's the wavelength of the light that's being used. If you were using a red laser like we were doing the last one, that would mean it's a red light, right? Here's what's weird about this. Despite the fact that L is changing, you would think that an increasing L would mean you're dividing by a bigger number and therefore you're gonna be producing a smaller lambda. And under normal circumstances, under a normal equation, you'd be 100% correct. But I'm gonna get this one out of the way first and just let you know, that even though you're moving the diffraction grating away from the screen, that wavelength is not going to change. So it won't change. And the reason I would say it won't change is because it's inherent to the problem, right? Let me put it this way. If you were doing an interference pattern using like a young double slit, double slit experiment, for instance, uh, and you were shining a red laser through it, and you're going, oh, okay, I'm producing all the little anti-nodes and stuff, and then you moved your screen away from it, is that gonna change the color of your laser? I, I, I certainly hope it won't, right? That doesn't make any sense. It's not gonna just change the color of your laser by moving your screen away from it, right? So it's inherent to the problem. In other words, your lambda, your wavelength, is pretty much anchored. Everything else has to move with it. So by increasing L, something else up here has to give 
in order to, to get it to go, right? Let's look at X. Remember, X is the distance between your central node, or sorry, your central anti-node uh, and your other nodes or anti-nodes, okay? X is the distance between those two. If L is increasing and lambda is inherent and won't change, how does X have to change in order to compensate for L increasing? Well, the answer to that would actually be X has to increase. If X is increasing, it's going to be counteracting the increasing L, right? And it'll be increasing at the exact same rate that L is increasing at. So in other words, if you move your screen away from your diffraction grating, uh, the distance between your, your anti-nodes is going to get bigger. Now D, D uh, is actually also inherent in this case. And let's just remind ourselves what D is. D is the difference between the, or the distance, sorry, between the slits on your screen. Just because you're moving that screen away from it doesn't mean that those slits in the screen are gonna change. So this one also won't change. It's inherent, right? So I'll just say it won't change. The distance between your slits is not like your diffraction grading is just gonna suddenly like change its shape, its shape just because you're moving a screen away from it. Um, so no, D is going to stay the same. N represents your node number or anti-node number, right? That one also won't change. I'm actually kind of seeing this is kind of a silly example to get, but it's good for dialogue, right? N is also not going to change. And the reason N is not going to change is the anti-node you're interested in is not just going to vanish, right? Unless you really moved it far away. Then I guess you have a different problem. That's just not even hit the screen anymore. But your N is not going to change. You're still going to be looking at your first anti-node or your second anti-node, uh, et cetera. Uh, last one here, theta, which of course is only found in this formula here. In order to figure out theta, again, the angle at which the light gets diffracted at, you actually have to think about what uh, D and N are doing. Remember, in this whole situation, D isn't changing, right? D is not changing, and N is not changing. So if D isn't changing, and N isn't changing, and lambda isn't changing, why on earth would your angle change? Well, it won't. So it also won't change. But again, an angle not changing is okay. The X is going to be the distance between those two nodes. Uh, so in other words, uh, even though the angle isn't changing, the distance between those two nodes or anti-nodes can still increase. Let me put it this way. If you had this angle right here, okay, that's all well and good between those two uh, screens. We have our X, it's a certain amount of distance. Now let's suppose I took this screen and I moved it away from it. This isn't going to change. This whole angle setup that we had is not going to change. But notice that the light is just gonna beam further and now suddenly you have a bigger X. That's why X is the only thing that changes if you changed your L, right? Hopefully that visual made things a little bit more uh, obvious there. If it didn't, oh well, whatever. Anyway, those are our, our old questions. We're gonna jump forward now to page 15 and talk about today's lesson. I really like this one, it's a really short one, um, but it's still really interesting nonetheless. The interference pattern in a double slit experiment is proof that light can behave like a wave, right? You wouldn't get that interference pattern with the, the nodes and the anti-nodes if it didn't behave like a wave. Uh, and there's also evidence that shows light behaves like a transverse wave, not a longitudinal wave. Let me remind you from Physics 20, a transverse wave is like a wave that you usually would think of, like an up and down, where a longitudinal wave is like a pulse. That's how sound would behave, right? Uh, now, transverse waves vibrate perpendicular to flow energy, longitudinal vibrate parallel, blah, 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 okay? Same idea. It's just think of, a, think of a flowy wave versus a pulse wave. That's about the only difference. Now, polarization happens uh, when you have basically a filtering screen. So when light vibrates in all planes, so if it's going up, down, you know, left, right, like it's vibrating in all these different planes as it's flowing through space and time, uh, then we call that non-polarized. In other words, it doesn't have a certain direction that it's going, right? Light is a wave, but it's a wave that waves in many different ways right? It waves up, down, left, right, all over the place. There's several different components to it. Like this picture kind of shows unpolarized light. It's kind of like waves all over the place. Now, a polarizing filter allows light of only one plane to pass through, meaning all light emerging through a filter will be vibrating in one plane. So either up and down or left and right, right? All the other planes of vibration have been blocked. It's been blocked and reflected off from the plane. It's not going to come through, okay? Uh, the two polarizing filters, however, placed at right angles to each other, will then block all the light. So in other words, if you really want to be uh, tricky with this, if you had a vertical polarizer, that's going to let your vertical beam of light through. And then if you put like a horizontal polarizer right on the other side of it, it'll block all of the light through. So in other words, none of that light's going to get through. 
most of the light we see is actually unpolarized or non-polarized, right? Non-polarized light um, is pretty much what gets produced by the sun or gets produced by light bulbs and stuff like that. But polarized light can be produced by certain artificial sources. And I'll show you a really interesting one in just a second here. Uh, so in the notepad, it said draw a diagram of how a polarized filter works. This is just another diagram. You don't have to draw this in your notes or anything. Bottom line is you have unpolarized light, you know, vibrating in all these different directions. Polarizing filter blocks everything except for the one that can go through the polarized filter. Okay, that's pretty much all there is to it. Now in the notepad, you'd also ask, give an example of where polarization is used. There's two big applications of this. Uh, certain sunglasses, not all sunglasses, they have to be special polarized sunglasses. I say special like it's a big deal. You can get them like at a gas station for like 10 bucks. It's not a big deal, but uh, polarized sunglasses uh, have a polarizing filter built right into them. So it only filters uh, a certain direction of light through. Uh, 3D movies also use polarized filters. Only certain kinds of light can get through the filters. Now unpolarized light like sunlight becomes polarized after reflecting off of a horizontal surface, okay? Really weird how that happens. It has to do with how it ref reflects and stuff and what gets reflected and what doesn't, right? So this explains why when you look at a lake, especially on a really sunny day, you'll often get glare off the surface of the lake, like really, 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 really bright spots, right? Glare forms because of uh, the polarized light that's kind of magnifying its, its, its intensity and it causes this annoying glare pattern, right? If you have polarized sunglasses, Polarized sunglasses help block that glare effect, which helps you see things better. It sees past the glare, so you're not getting that annoying, semi-painful glare shine from the surface of the water. So this poster, I just found this by Googling it, but I've seen posters like this in gas stations and stuff several times. Uh, polarization is really good for people who do angling, right? So people who fish, um, because if you wear polarized sunglasses, this helps with, uh, block the glare from the surface of the water and can actually help you see any of the fish that are close to the surface. So in this picture, it's kind of a total exaggeration. Um, but if you ever looked at water, you might be able to see a fish that's very close to the surface, but he's very faded out. That's because there's still glare coming off the surface of the water. But if you wore polarized lenses, they really pop out a lot more. So it's a lot easier to uh, see the fish. It's also a lot easier on your eyes because you're not getting the glare effect. Now, I actually own a pair of polarized sunglasses. Uh, I just keep them in my vehicle all the time. Again, I, I also like totally admit I got them at a gas station like 10 years ago uh, for probably like 15 bucks or something like that. Uh, but I do own a pair of polarized sunglasses and it's quite interesting when you play around with them and you see what they can be used for and what kind of effects they have. Now, remember earlier, I told you that sunlight is unpolarized, but certain artificial light sources, not counting light bulbs, because light bulbs are unpolarized, but certain artificial light sources will actually produce polarized light. It has to do with how the screen is formed uh, and the light just comes out of it in a certain way. Chances are the screen you're looking at right now to watch this video is actually shooting out polarized light. Uh, I certainly know my monitor at home that I'm recording this with uh, is a polarized monitor. Long story short, I decided to make a little video of this. It's gonna be super interesting, believe me. Um, but it's gonna show you how my polarized sunglasses can actually serve as a filter to block the polarized light from my monitor. So what we're looking at right now is my monitor screen. Here's what happened when I used my sunglasses. So super interesting, I know, but if we go back to some of it right here, especially right at this point, notice how you can still see through the sunglasses and then about right here, where was it, right here? You cannot. And that's because these sunglasses have a special polarizing filter in them. So the polarized light coming from the screen is getting blocked almost entirely by the, the sunglasses themselves. So when I looked at this screen sideways, uh, as I would with my head turned sideways wearing the sunglasses, you don't see anything at all. It completely goes dark as if there's no light coming from it at all because all of the light is being blocked. So it might as well be wearing blindfold at that point, okay? Uh, anyway, for practice, we're all done today. That was a relatively quick lesson. Uh, for practice, polarization worksheet page 16. That's what I want you to work on for today. Uh, it literally is just page 16. I think there's only one question on it. Most of your time today should be spent working on the Wave Nature Light worksheet, which was page uh, nine to 14. That was from last class. There's a lot of questions in there, I understand, but of course it is 
important to understand how all these variables play into it. And if you've already done all of them, then awesome. You have not much else to do today. Anyway, as usual, if you need any help from me, send me uh, an email or send me a remind. And uh, best of luck.